we've done a lot of work looking at rail devolution, um, uh, including looking at Mersey Rail and London Overground, and I think the story is unambiguous that it, those, that devolution has transformed um, really terrible rail networks, misery rail um, and uh, the fag ends of the Silverlink uh, network in London, the North London line, into uh, rail networks that um, uh, regularly top the transport focus um, passenger survey polls, um, you know, in terms of passenger satisfaction, reliability, and so on. But, but there isn't, a, there isn't a, a baseline for the whole country, is there? Um, no, but um, all we can say is that a lot of local rail lines, particularly inner suburban ones, have been just massively neglected for years and years and years. Um, uh, British Rail spent years trying to close the North London line. Um, at Mersey Rail was massively neglected um, uh, when it was run from the centre. Um, and I think um, it's clear that um, the advent of Rail North mm -hmm. has led to, for the first time ever, some serious commitments to some serious improvements in local rail services in the north, because the baseline, is, which is what the Department for Transport's mm -hmm. been letting mm -hmm. um, in the last 20 years, has been terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and um, stations, trains, customer service have all been neglected. And for rail, I think um, devolution has to be the right thing to do for local rail services. Um, Scotland, um, uh, the, the new ScotRail franchise, um, clearly looks better, um, I mean, it's early days, uh, than what went before. Serco on the, the uh, sleeper? Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, I mean, all the research we've done says that, um, you know, devolution so far has worked and um, for rail. I, I mean, I think the really interesting thing, one of the things the Chancellor said today was about an oyster card for the North. Um, and um, that's something we, or rather we commissioned uh, Green Gage to Ooh. do some work on, the, on this. And they pointed out that, um, that the opportunity that Rail North gives is to simplify the whole fare yeah. structure and create simple zonal fares across the north, um, so, uh, which are multimodal. I mean, that takes us in to um, issues about bus regulation and so on, um, mm. which I know is uh, current in a lot of the city regions. But the opportunity to create um, simple smart ticketing across the north um, is, uh, is one that I think uh, you know, needs to be grasped and uh, the integrating rail and bus really makes sense. But of course the fare structures will be completely different from the north and the south, but that doesn't really matter, does it, on a smart card? No, um, but the, the, the principle of simple zonal fares you can translate and, and there are, you know, um, there are um, smart card um, kind of standards, yeah. um, uh, which I think um, a previous director of Mersey Travel was deeply involved in setting up, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and, um, you know, that, uh, so you can have interoperable uh, cards. So, devolution, tell me, um, what did Ch George actually say today? Um, in terms of what uh, I understand the Chancellor has said, is he's giving additional powers, first and foremost, to Greater Manchester with regards to things like their fire brigade and planning uh, powers, over and above what has already been pledged to them uh, through the Greater Manchester deal. The great news for us in the Liverpool city region is we are also involved in those discussions, as are the Sheffield city region, as are other places like Cornwall. How do you make um, sure that Manchester doesn't dominate? I think from our perspective, if we look at what Manchester have kind of already agreed as a good start, but we want to bank all of that and get more of it, actually. And so a good start in terms of the things that they have already uh, got out of it from a transport perspective, yes. things like bus franchising. You know, here in London, we all know how wonderfully well that has worked for the bus network. We believe we could do exactly the same in the north big cities, be that in Manchester, which they'll be doing shortly, and hopefully they'd been able to do it in, in London as well. And that then comes into the opportunities of multimodal smart ticketing, a great opportunity not just with Rail North, but with the future with Transport for North, actually to roll that out and have a much more functioning uh, fair structure which gets people from A to B in a simple way and in an affordable way too. But do you think that enough uh, emphasis has been put on the Northern Network? 
I mean, are, are, I'm talking about Merseyside now, I'm not talking about... Do you think actually there are other things that you could be doing in developing and extending, or is that not on the cards? I think we're starting to do that. So I'll be very, very blunt with you. I think particularly on the rail network in the north of England, we've had two decades of missed opportunity with all of this. Uh, we haven't experienced the kind of investment that you've seen, uh, be it in London and parts of the south east, mm. or be it in places like Scotland and Wales as well. Um, and from our perspective, what we've been able to see in Merseyside with Mersey Rail, yeah. when we've had that devolved, that's been... Uh, an unmitigated success story. And how do you measure that with customers? I mean, obviously it's footfall. Uh, no, it's not just footfall. Actually, it's things like um, National Passenger Survey. We yeah. regularly come out as, as one of the best operations in the country. We're, in, in terms of Mersey Rail, it's operation that we oversee um, in terms of how that's delivered. It's actually the only train operator that's recommended by which. So we do kind of measure it, not just in traditional kind of industry standards, but actually yeah. against other kind of peer but industries. What kind of innovative things are you doing? I mean, I was astonished to hear from Toronto that they only cleaned the trains in the middle of the night. That was kind of bonkers. No wonder the trains were so filthy. I'm mean, not suggesting they're filthy in Mersey. <laughs> no, but I mean, what, what, are there th are things that you've done that have changed that are quite, you know, like no-brainers? I think a lot of it is about having a real local focus. Yeah. Um, and it's things like our fare structure, for example. Uh, currently, with Mersey Rail, our fare structure is pegged to retail price index. Mm -hmm. Not because we just like things cheap. Actually, it's because what our population currently can afford. Now, what we would like to see is if um, people's earnings and wealth grows, then obviously that can be reviewed in the fullness of time. And that's a similar approach we're trying to take with, with regards to Rail North as well. Having a fare structure that's not only simple, but actually is affordable, so we can use it as a means to attract more people onto the train, because more bums on seats actually means more and money in the fare box. Absolutely, that's a key part of it. Um, we've got a very good timetable in terms of what we operate on Mersey Rail, but what we've negotiated through the process of Rail North is actually mm -hmm. going to see additional services through the day into the evenings, and particularly at the weekend. Yeah. And um, I appreciate that sort of George Osborne has announced about Sunday trading um, hours, which is interesting, because one of the key things we've been focusing on is more trains on a Sunday. Yeah. It's the second busiest shopping day of the week, and we need to be able to make sure people can get around in our rail network. Um, Colin, is devolution good for London or bad for London? It's got to be good for London. Uh, we've been uh, campaigning ever since the London Finance Commission, which was started by the mayor, about fiscal devolution, tax devolution to, to London. But I think when it comes to, to, to rail, the argument is even, is even stronger. Stephen was talking about London Overground, which has gone from being one of the worst... Uh, dis most disliked, I suspect, uh, lines or the lines that are in there to, 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 to doing incredibly well and satisfaction surveys have, have gone up. We think that it's now time to look at other rail lines. I mean, if you've got a spaghetti-like um, uh, configuration coming into London and you then do things like London Bridge, completely rebuild as, as, as network rail never... Uh, stop saying it's like doing open heart surgery, you know, um, in the middle uh, of, of, of London. Then the fact that you've got all these other rail lines and, and, and no unifying idea above it is bound to cause the sort of chaos so that we've seen. So what kind of unifying, are you looking for unified ideas? You've got I think, fair structures, but you're, they're yep. there already. So yep. what else do you mean well, to I think Well, I think I'd like to bring the rest of uh, the overground railways under, or at least investigate putting the rest of the over, overground railways under the same sort of models, which is basically a concession model. You know, TfL uh, buy, procure the, uh, the rolling stock, uh, they lay down strict lines, and your private enterprise comes in and delivers it, and delivers it extremely well. So I think that's the sort of model we should have. I should just tell you that the figures, uh, you know, we've just polled our members, uh, and 48%, nearly 50%, said they had staff unable to come to work because of rail overground rail delays during the, during the last year. One in 10 negatively affected by delays at least once a week. And 40% said poor reliability of commuter rail service is one of the top three issues. Now, top three issues, we, we, we as you can imagine, the Chamber of Commerce, we're looking into the issues that affect business all the time. The top three issues are usually uh, the tube, not overground, uh, um, uh, crime uh, and skills. Now, overground is becoming, a, becoming an issue uh, for, for London businesses. And as we start to need, you know, as you know, 40 or 50,000 houses have to be built, new houses have to be built in London. They're not all going to be in London. You I know, well, well 50,000 a year uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is what we need. And they're going to be out. And therefore, the commuter rail services, I suspect, are going to become even more important. Even if we don't go into the green belt, as you know, all the debates we might have with that, but it's going to be wider out. We're going to need a better transport system to deal with that.
I think the arguments here are, are, are both um, practical operational ones um, about, as Liam says, a local focus, and the strategic ones about being able to plan um, new development uh, and economic development around the rail network. Um, and uh, I mean, the operational one, um, I, uh, like other people here actually, were at a, com a bus conference in Manchester last week where Manchester Piccadilly basically shut down because Network Rail run that, no, there's no control over it. One train had a problem outside the station, they shut the whole station. And Transport Greater Manchester and the other northern authorities had no say over that. And as somebody from TFGM said, if we'd had control of that, we would have been able to get that lots better information, much better management. And the strategic point is that I know T in London, I know TFL have done some detailed work on exactly how you could massively upgrade the inner suburban rail network to, with more frequency, um, but, um, interchanges and things like that, um, serving, uh, there's already a plan to build the railway into Barking to, for, to, to serve an area of large house building. Um, but, you know, the, the, the fact is that there's something like 15% more car use south of the Thames where the overground predominates than there is north of the Thames. But is, and, where is the money coming from to develop services south of the Thames? Well, um, actually, most of it, I mean, a lot of this is stuff that will be in the next 10-year investment programme. But, uh, uh, in fact, the housing... The, the money from the housing can, as has happened with Crossrail, pay for some of this development. I mean, the Metropolitan Railway developed by selling off the land around the stations. And um, uh, even in rural Devon, there's a, 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 a scheme there to reopen the railway to Tavistock, paid for by house buildings. So it seems to me that it's possible to pay for this stuff by the, the uplift yeah, in housing. What about that whole idea of imagination? Because we were talking earlier about the Borders Railway, the imagination yes. uh, to, to open... Uh, services again because a lot of the track beds are there but you have a lot more opposition from everything from the environmental lobby to noise pollution to whatever but are, are we are we just working with what we've got by and large apart from children's in Scotland or is there an actual possibility to re-engineer railway across the United Kingdom well we're already seeing the um uh, unless that's been paused while we haven't noticed, the reopening of the East-West Rail link. So the Oxford-Cambridge railway line, um, the first part of that, well, it, some of it's un, un, under construction yeah. now, um, so that there'll be a new route to Oxford for the first time ever, and um, that there will be at least the first part, the Oxford Milton Keynes bit. Um, I've often said this to rail audiences, but I think we're probably the only developed country in the world, possibly the only country in the world, which would have done what happened in the 1960s when the Minister of Transport made a statement to the Parliament announcing the closure of the Oxford-Cambridge railway line in the same week as the Minister of Housing and Local Government made a statement to Parliament designating Milton Keynes as a new town yeah, yeah. on the site of the railway. Because at that time, every, uh, and that, that disconnect between rail planning and land use planning is something that's bedeviled this country, and I think we're starting to see that getting back. I know uh, Mersey Travel mm -hmm. have plans to uh, uh, connect Skelmersdale, new town, another yeah. new town that was built without any rail connections, back into the rail network. Um, and you know, there are prospects around the place. Um, uh, Wisbeach yes. is, is an example of a place that really needs to, uh, its rail link back, and that's got wider economic benefits for being able to serve the wider Cambridge. Yeah. But I think, it, 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 I think we, have to, we yeah. have to see it in a wider context. You're absolutely right. The money, of course, is, 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 is the issue. We take Crossrail. Yeah. We were the first business organisation. Yeah, our first paper on Crossrail was 1973. Fantastic how successful an organisation we've been. We get it in two years' time. We've been banging on about Crossrail too for, for, for a number of years now. But the truth is that Crossrail uh, is being built with both public money and private money. Uh, and, you know, you, when you look at the funding of Crossrail, there's the fare box, there's, there's business, uh, and there is central government. So there are other models. Yes. And we, we had, a, we had a, a brainstorm. We do a thing called uh, Future London. And we had a brainstorm the other week. And someone said, actually, when you're fighting for Crossrail too, we, you should say... 
actually, what we need is a new housing project. Oh, and maybe we can throw in another railway. Because yeah, actually, yeah. that's yeah, the key. Exactly. Once, you get, once, you, once you get business involved, and once business see, uh, if you talk to big developers, they say they're following Crossrail 1, and they'll follow Crossrail 2. Well, as a way of, 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 of coming together and finding the finance. And then there's a bit about fiscal devolution, tax devolution for the big cities, not just for London, where you say there's this very clever formula that Tony Travers, the LSE, came up with, which, is, which basically could give uh, a money that could be spent at least on the planning of these things. You know, at the moment, we're, for Crossrail 2, we have to rely on the Chancellor uh, to give us, what, a million, I can't remember, Stephen, he gave a million or two million quid to do the planning. Well, that's stupid. You know, locally, we should be deciding that, and then we should be being pressure to bear. That's why mayors are so important to this. The great thing about London, and the reason that Manchester's going to get anything is because they've given in well, and agreed to a mayor, as it were, is because you can now put pressure on the mayor to say, actually, you got this wrong. And locally... And the mayor can the, put pressure on. No, we can put pressure on the, on mayor, the mayor, and, you know, with the assembly, we can make those points. It becomes a very much localised thing, therefore the decision-making becomes much more acute. Forgive me, once upon a time there was a very uh, important person in uh, Liverpool, but now, who's your mayor? Uh, our mayor is Joe Anderson, but that, he only covers the city of Liverpool. Yeah. Obviously, our wider city region, yeah. which is our functioning uh, economic area, is a variety of different district leaders. So, you don't, so what about a kind of mayor that oversees the whole of the greater Liverpool area, the greater Mersey area? I mean, that, 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 in a sense, would be a good counterweight to Manchester, or it would, be a, it would, it would spur each other on. Um, it's an interesting debate, and as you can imagine, there's a variety of different views yeah. uh, back in my part I of the would world. Tell, I would say, I would um, say to but your, your people, you, 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 you've got to do it. I mean, as yeah. a Merseyside, I come from Birkenhead, and you can imagine what Birkenhead and Prenton and all those other places, the middle classes would think about being ruled by. But actually, it will make Liverpool... Yeah. Yeah. And it's Much more successful you, you it is now. The nail on the head. I actually think we shouldn't just be focusing purely on the governance model. No, we should be making sure it's a really compelling package of devolved powers and finance yeah. that goes with that. Then you can sort out the governance model which will be best in the ways that you do it. I think what's interesting is you look at the mayoral models that one exists here in London with regard to the strong figures that Ken and Boris have been and the development of what's happening in Greater Manchester which is a different model and actually which will be based more on the consents of the different districts as well because the districts yeah. with Within the structure will have the ability, if something's not going right, actually to step in and say, that, say to the mayor, no, we're going to do it differently. But the deal, so the, deal, the Osborne right deal somewhere. was, you don't get any of this and, unless you have a mayor. And I think Osborne was absolutely right about that. I think one of the best things that's happened to London, uh, and remember London was a declining city for many years, especially when I first came to London in the 70s, it was a declining city. Part of the reason for the, apart from the Big Bang and all the financial things, is the mayor, both Ken and Boris, gave a focus that we never had before. And a personality. And a personality, and a voice. And a, a, we, we, we keep saying, you know, we, sadly we don't lobby the mayor enough because he hasn't got enough power to build railways and all those sort of things. What we need to give is the mayor more power, and then we would see, I think, an even greater tra 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 trajectory going up. It's one of the best things that's happened. Would you agree with that? Um, I think that uh, I, I think that Liam is right that places will have to develop their own models because yeah. uh, what's right for um, Manchester won't necessarily be right for Merseyside. But I do agree that the um, that the model of having a mayor and districts um, sounds right yeah. for a lot of places, um, and and it, it we'll have to see. I can't see how a mayor for Cornwall will work, but uh, uh, you know uh, that's that's to be worked mm -hmm. out.